Good evening, and welcome to another edition of Nevada County Interviews. I'm your host, Paul Minicucci. And tonight, we are going to uh, speak about a terrifically important subject, but one that flies under the medical radar, as it, as it is, and it's called Traumatic Brain Injury, uh, TBI for short. And I have two guests in the studio with me, Cindy Shaw and Rochelle Blacksburg. And um, we're going to delve into this subject because uh, we call it the hidden epidemic because it's a uh, tremendously difficult um, uh, condition that people find themselves in, and um, it affects a wide range of uh, people in your life, from your family to the community. Uh, and yet, it doesn't seem to be on the radar of most uh, physicians, medical schools, or insurance companies, to be sure. So we thought this subject needed to have a uh, bright light shown on it, and that's why uh, we have Cindy here with us. So, Cindy, uh, welcome, and uh, you're going to tell us a little bit about traumatic brain injury and what it is. And you have a prop here, I see. I do have a prop. I've got the skull and the brain. Um, so traumatic brain injury typically is, um, happens after a car accident. That would be your classic uh, traumatic brain injury. Usually it's something that happens where there's an acceleration, deceleration incident. Could also be a fall. So there's a starting and a stopping. Most of our traumatic brain injuries have to do with uh, highway accidents. So Highway 49, Highway 20, and so on, where we have um, people either going off the road or head-on collisions or other trees, those sorts of things. And I would say in the paper I pick up maybe one a week or every other week where it suggests that with the life flight down to either Roseville or over to Chico or perhaps to Sacramento that there's been a traumatic brain injury. Mm -hmm. um, there are other um, things like skateboard accidents for children or it could even be falling off of a ladder or something falling on your head. So there are a lot of mechanisms for that, but usually it has to do something to do with uh, velocity and a, and a hit. Mm -hmm. So now that we know a little bit about it, tell me about what your job is and, and what that entails. Well, as a speech pathologist, I do many things having to do with uh, speech, cognition, and um, swallowing. And in regards to traumatic brain injury, you could have any of those problems. In the beginning, you would typically probably be looking more at the swallowing aspect. Um, once the, um, the doctors are sure that the patient is able to breathe, then we would look at uh, swallowing. And um, from there, as the patient starts to become alert, um, some people are in a coma, come out of the coma, then we start to look at communication and uh, eventually look at um, thinking skills, memory, attention, and those sorts of things, as well as um, the emotional overlay that happens with a traumatic brain injury. And uh, how, how did you get interested in traumatic brain injury in your training? That's a good question. Um, it's a question you ask yourself a lot these days. <laughs> Well, I was fortunate to work in a rehabilitation center that specialized in traumatic brain injury. In the town of Pasadena, there were a group of parents who saw this gaping hole. There was nothing for their children to rehabilitate them after these horrific accidents. So a group of uh, parents came together and started a cognitive rehabilitation center on their own. So that was a community-run center, and I just happened to be at the right place at the right time, not only to get that job, but then eventually a large corporation came in and bought the center and made that part of their own. That was Casa Colina. And uh, that kind of started my interest in traumatic brain injury as far as, um, as, far as that particular diagnosis. Did there come a, a, a point in your career where you said, aha, this is something really important that I ought to um, take up as a specialty, or was it a more gradual thing? How did you get into TBI? I, I think as soon as I had the opportunity to work in that center, and I saw these people who were you know, living these normal lives were suddenly thrust into this huge change as a result of the traumatic brain injury, I just knew that that was something that I would have a passion for um, 
and I was fortunate again to, to have the opportunity to work in that setting. No, I'm not ignoring Rochelle. We're going to get to Rochelle's story in a little bit. But I think it's important for our uh, folks at home to know uh, some more background about it and why it's – why is it the uh, silent epidemic or the hidden epidemic? Well, that's a very good question. Probably a lot of people that we know have traumatic brain injuries and we don't even realize it. Because when we think of an injury, we think of broken arms and legs. And even when a patient is in a car accident, the first thing they do is, you know, look at the orthopedic aspect of it. Um, but in a lot of cases, there is no real physical manifestation left mm -hmm. over. The arms and the legs heal up. But the most dramatic change ends up being the um, inability to handle thinking and emotions. So you can't see that. And I run a, um, a monthly support group, and if you were to come to the group, you wouldn't be able to tell who had a head injury and who did not have a head injury. Right. Yeah. Now, I worked in, uh, as we were discussing off camera, I worked in a legislature for several years on this issue when I was on the uh, staff of the Senate Health Committee here in California, and uh, I was just amazed at how little is known, how much people don't, don't pay attention to this. There's a lack of policy, uh, and, and, and lots of folks in you know, the medical establishment or the corporate medical uh, departments um, try whatever they can to sort of diminish traumatic brain injury. There's a lot of naysayers um, out there. And one thing that we did learn uh, from some of the uh, folks who had sustained traumatic brain injury was that um, in several cases, they themselves didn't know that they'd been injured. That uh, I have one case where a young man woke up, uh, he came, came back to consciousness as he was on the street corner. He felt like he had fainted. And it turned out nobody actually stayed with him, which was amazing to me, but he had got hit by a car and he didn't know it. Wow. And there was no, uh, you know, and it wasn't until five or six months later you know, after things started happening, as you point out, you know, the, the pathology of it um, started affecting him, and he happened to have a doctor who knew a little bit about traumatic brain injury that he actually got diagnosed with it. So does this happen a lot, that doctors miss this? Absolutely, and I, I think back to a case that um, was, was real poignant where there was a, um, I, I would say she was about 26 or 27 years old, and it had been five years since her accident. She had gone off-roading with some friends, and when she came through the ER, they did the usual, they did the x-rays, and they fixed up her bones and so on, and then they sent her home. And after that, she was never able to live on her own again. Uh, she had to move in with her parents, and they chalked it up as some sort of psychosis. Right. She uh, continued to pursue um, um, medical treatment, and some, at one point she ran into a doctor who said, wait a minute, did, did you lose consciousness? And she said, well, that's what I was told because the person doesn't remember that they lost right. consciousness. Course, yeah. And he went back to the emergency room records and combed through what she had. So this took a lot of time on his part, ended up getting her a mag uh, an MRI, and it showed up that she had had some uh, frontal lobe damage. It showed up on the MRI, and she was able to get some treatment for her traumatic brain injury after that. So this was five years later, and she was being treated as a patient with psychosis. Right. All of a sudden, and, and this is what happens. Seemingly regular neural people show up with psychosis all over the place. It's amazing. Exactly. <laughs> um, and, and, and we're going to talk about uh, perhaps the biggest adjustments and changes in a person's life, which happened on the emotional, um, you know, interrelationship side with families, mm -hmm. members, and so forth, because that's you know, really where this plays out. Mm -hmm. But for now, let's talk a little bit more about the mechanics of it. We have a brain here. Uh, do you want to okay. show us what, sure. what happens in a traumatic brain injury? Okay, so I have here a skull, and we're going to take off the skull cap. And by the way, I did go to a brain dissection um, course. It was a four-day course at Marquette University. Mm -hmm. And uh, they actually sawed the skull off just like this. Um, so I'll turn this around so you can see. And uh, this is not real. <laughs> but uh, what you may not, I don't know if you, how well you can see, there are bony protuberances inside the skull cap. So this contains the brain. The brain is actually fairly gelatinous, so it's, it's soft. And it fits right inside the cranium. 
And what happens is that during the accident, the brain will get jostled around inside the skull. So one of the primary points of, um, uh, is right here in the frontal lobe because usually people hit the front of their head in a car accident. Let's just say, for example, just using the classic head injury. And the underside of the brain here is, can then be impaled by the skull itself. Um, as well, the other mechanisms are that this is the brain stem here. So what you have is you have uh, uh, the neck. You have this small body holding three pounds on top of it. So you get a torquing action that happens. That's one of the actions. And that creates this twisting and turning on the brain stem that can then lead to troubles in the, in the beginning with, with respiration, breathing, swallowing, those tor sorts of basic functions. And then um, there's also the, the impact. And so you hit the front of the head here, and then it has a coup and contra coup where it will hit the back of the head mm -hmm. as well. So you have two points that are may have a complete impact and hitting the front of the head for example a lot of people lose their sense of smell because right here are the olfactory bulbs and um, then you have the optic chiasm right below here so most people also have visual problems um, so that's another thing then the other thing is if you're going 50 miles per hour one way and 50 miles per hour another way that's 100 miles an hour impact and there you find diffuse axonal uh, damage so on autopsy, for example, you can see that all of these axons and neurons have been damaged, and um, there are billions upon billions of, of brain cells. So uh, that can only be seen, but they're obviously very small, so that can be seen. Now, when you talk about, so this is the, these are the cerebellum here, wow. cerebelli, and we'll put these, take these off for a minute so I can show you. Um, under the brain stem here. Come on. So if we take, if we have here the frontal lobes and uh, the temporal lobes and the occipital lobe here, we're going to take off this part of the brain. It will come. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to take off the temporal lobes and the back of the occipital lobe. Now here's the brain stem. And here's the part where our emotions are seated in the limbic system. And so you can see they're sitting on top of the brain stem fit right up inside the frontal lobe there. Very vulnerable. And what happens is the limbic system controls our emotions, also has to do with the fight or flight response with the amygdala, and also the hippocampus, which stores our memories and has to do with spatial, uh, helping us with some spatial orientation. So very vulnerable when you hit your head that the emotional center and the short-term memory center are also affected, as well as the fact that attention, personality, insight, those sorts of things are affected in the frontal lobe. Um, so that's kind of a, a, a basic Good. of how the brain can be affected by an accident. Of course, it could, you could have something fall on the brain, and then you have a different trajectory here, and then you have damage to specific parts of the brain, but then also those other mechanisms at work. Well, um, Cindy recommended that we um, actually run a video. Can you set us, this is the Washington um, so University of, of Washington, of Washington yeah. um, video. So this is a, I, I believe she's a physiatrist, the doctor who runs the rehabilitation center there. And um, she's going to discuss brain function, talk about the rehab team, and talk about some mechanisms for head injury. And I believe there are some vignettes with right. four different patients and right. how there can be great variation within that set as far as the type of accident and the results of the accident. And uh, the, the whole um, tape runs, uh, I think, about 40 minutes. We're only going to run the first nine minutes. So if the control room can queue up that first uh, video, uh, we'll take a look at it. And then we'll be back. Think forward. Think research channel. <laughs>
Having a head injury um, and ended my life the way it was before. There were times when I thought it was just so absurd, so unfair, that, um, you know, I had some real moments of despair. The thing that I miss the most is having the capabilities and ability that I used to have. No, just in shock. Why do I hear? Why do I think he's funny? Where am I? Anita, she, Alan, and Brian have had traumatic brain injuries, or TBI. Almost a quarter of a million Americans are hospitalized every year with brain injuries. TBI can alter an individual's physical abilities. Even more devastating are the potential personality changes and loss of cognitive skills. People may have uh, paralysis. They may have problems with speaking or understanding language. They may have problems with double vision. Um, they may have um, difficulty with moving about. Um, the most common problems that people have, and this stretches across mild to more severe brain injuries, are problems with thinking and problems with managing behavior or emotions. Um, even for people who have relatively mild brain injuries, they often have a more difficult time with thinking. They may think slower, uh, take them longer to process information. Um, they may have problems with their memory. Since I had a head injury, it doesn't take very much pressure to make my mind go blank. You know, you just, it just sort of shorts out and you can't think. And so I have to do a lot of things to um, sort of organize the way information comes in and control how much comes in so I don't get overwhelmed by too much at once. If I'm able to do that, then gradually I'm able, I've been able to return to the kind of work I used to do, which is really important to me. You know, like all the people who yeah. run the park. Yeah. <laughs> Four years ago, a car accident left Anita Kay with broken bones in her pelvis and lower back. Being physically strong and athletic was part of my identity. The day before the accident, I ran around Discovery Park, for example. So it was hard to go immediately, you know, in one day from someone who does that to someone who can't even stand up. Anita regained much of her physical abilities through rehabilitation therapy and a lot of determined work. But she had a brain injury as well, and that has been the longest part of Anita's recovery. I had no idea going in how long it would take, and I think it's really important for people to be realistic or to know they're in for a long haul. About nine months after my wreck, I had a neuropsych evaluation, and the neuropsychologist said, that with the kind of head injury I had, it could take four and a half years for it to uh, be better. And I got very angry when I heard that. I thought he was a quack. I thought he didn't know what he was talking about. I mean, I was in complete denial, and I completely pushed that information away. Anita was a health policy system analyst who worked with a lot of data. Immediately after the accident, she couldn't read, and she couldn't do math. In traumatic brain injury, oftentimes there is damage to the neurons, and those neurons carry out our vital functions of, of thinking of emotions and all of our physical behaviors. When there is damage to certain of our neurons, um, we cr there's inefficiency in how the brain processes information. When I'm working on a, on a problem in data analysis, in the past I could track mentally the steps in the process. Now, I have, I'm, it's difficult for me to do that, so I've had to change the ways I do my work. I open up, like on a computer, I open up a separate window and I write notes about each step that I go through, um, even for sort of relatively simple processes, because um, I can't trust myself to, you know, get a line of thought going again and hold it after I've been interrupted or follow it all the way through if it's really complex. Learning to make adjustments and preparing to go back to work are part of rehabilitation. There are people called vocational rehabilitation counselors 
who can help sit people down and work out what are they good at, um, what kind of work or productive activity is out there that they might be able to take their old skills and learn some new things and apply them to a new kind of work or a new kind of volunteer activity so that they can have productivity in their life and feel accomplished. Answering those questions is the first step. Next is fitting an individual's new abilities into the workplace. Sometimes they're very, very uh, marketable and then also some, some things that have to be worked around or in certain cases we're going to have to get resources and assistive technology and other kinds of things to help you work around your barriers. The job's going to have to be done uh, differently by procedurally or we may have to modify the workstation or we may have to use a certain type of computer program to help you do the work better. They help me work toward those goals and they would adjust the therapies that would help me to um, develop abilities that would get me back to what I want and those things for me again were to be able to go back to work doing something like my former work um, to be able to go back outside and enjoy athletics again um, and so that that helped a lot. I think support groups are helpful also um, uh, hopefully it's a support group that really has a focus about optimizing community adaptation but you know a feedback from your peers um, uh, sometimes it's easier to accept from another person with a brain injury than even, even loved ones. Anita continues to recover, continues to define the way she lives now. Recently after all the weather with all the big windstorms, I've been watching a osprey nest. There's a tall pole along, you know, Marine Drive, there's a osprey nest up there. So I've been watching, you know, a situation where uh, roofs have blown off, trees have fallen over, um, all of this destruction, but that nest is still up there. <laughs> and um, that's what I do now. It's like um, I want to look around me every day and find things that are an inspiration to keep going. <laughs> Traumatic brain injury happens when force is applied to the skull. What happens is that the force is transmitted through the skull and the brain, which is a very soft material, kind of on the order of cottage cheese, gets this force applied to it and, not surprisingly, deforms, has bleeding, has swelling, and that ends up either destroying or at least partially damaging the neurons that make up the brain. It's ironic. It's a fragile item. It's this three-pound substance with you know, a nice, tough, skin-like covering. I, I love the Latin term for that. As, as someone with a tough Italian mother, I like the notion of dura mater, tough mother, is what protects it. And the cerebral spinal fluid protects it. The skull is very thick. It protects it. There, there's really a tremendous amount of protection, but there are also a lot of things that can go wrong in a, in a severe traumatic brain injury. The frontal lobes and temporal lobes are most vulnerable in any type of brain injury. Damage to those lobes affects a person's executive We've talked a little bit about, you know, the uh, physiology of a TBI. So let's delve into um, personal stories. And as you said, every story is different. The circumstances of a person's life are different. Uh, what they lose um, in, in the process and what they regain may be different. And, and we're going to ask Rochelle to... Uh, talk about her particular injury uh, and what what she faced and how you know the rehabilitation she went through. I, 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 wa I want to tell one story. Uh, the most moving story I heard when I was working in the legislature was a law student who was a third year law student at Bolt Hall, a br real brilliant guy. And he said, now imagine what this would be like. You, you wrote papers and you, you had briefs that were reasoned and you know complex kinds of papers and now you know, two years after the, my accident, I can't read, I don't understand what I just wrote. What would that do to your psyche in terms of knowing that I've lost so much cognitive skills and, you know, will I ever get them back? And so, you know, in addition to the fact that, uh, you know, the emotional parts of the brain may be injured themselves, just the adjustment is a, is a great, uh, you know, challenge for people. So, Rochelle, tell us, uh, if you will, about what happened to you and shortly thereafter and then in, in the longer haul what happened? Okay, I was hit on the head by an access panel that came down on me so it hit 
from the back to the front. So I, and it, and it compressed. So I also had neck and shoulder injury that went along with it, but still not anything anyone could see. <laughs> now, did you, um, were you aware of the panel hitting? Did you remember it? At this point, I don't know if I remember the accident or if it's just because people t have told me about it so much. I mean, I can tell the story, but I don't really remember it that well. Yep. I've lost two years of memory of my life. There's two years I don't remember at all, mm -hmm. except for from stories that I've heard over and over again. So uh, you you had this injury. Um, what what happened next? When did you become conscious again, and how how did you get? Uh, taken to the hospital or what happened there? Well, I thought I was okay because we're raised to think, you know, if you get bumped on the head, everything's fine. It's just a bump on the head. So you have to continue to work and go on. Um, I went to my purse to get some arnica because I thought, oh, I'm going to have a bump. And then I felt a bump coming up right on my forehead. And I thought, okay, I better call my husband and have him bring some of the rubbing on arnica to make sure that I don't have a big bump on my head. I was more concerned about a bump on my head than anything else. Right. And he came... <clears throat> And he said, honey, you're not okay. And evidently I argued with him that I was fine and just give me the darn arnica. And that's kind of one of the changes that happened with me. It was almost like permanent PMS. Mm. I was just kind of a witch. Taken over by some <laughs> other mind. Literally, that's probably what was, what was happening. So, um, yeah. so after a while, he took me to the hospital when somebody else came in and I needed a second opinion for somebody else coming in saying, well, Michelle, you're not, you're not okay. You're not you. And so what was your work that you were I was at? the manager of a pet store at that point. Mm -hmm. And so people would be asking me questions, and I would be giving them answers, but they would be answers to questions that they hadn't asked. They were good answers. They just didn't go with the questions that were being asked at mm -hmm. that time. So you tried to return to work uh, quickly after you got from mm -hmm. the hospital? Oh. I got I worse. Once I, once I left and went to the hospital, they did all the intake and asking me questions, and do you know who the president was? I didn't know who the president was. Um, and I, I didn't answer most of the questions right. And it just got worse and worse from there. Um, by the time I got home, my headache was so bad, I, I thought, geez, I, knew, I thought I knew what a headache was, but I didn't. Mm -hmm. this, this is horrific. And it just continued to get worse and continued to get worse. And I couldn't talk very well. I was stuttering. Um, I couldn't balance. My balance was gone. I cruised the furniture like a toddler. Um, I just couldn't really do anything, and I slept almost all the time. And um, how long a period were you in that condition? Do you know? Well, for the first year, I was like that for sure. Mm -hmm. I didn't get any treatment except for the standard 12 visits to physical therapy that you get with workers' comp because they don't believe that you're not faking it. Mm -hmm. um, so. Cindy, tell me about why that happens. What, what, what were the barriers that Rochelle were up against? Well, <clears throat> number one, you couldn't see it, and they may or may not have done um, some tests that showed anything. So an initial CAT scan, they're looking for bleeding. And if you're not bleeding, then there's nothing wrong. Right. And so then they send you home. And so because there was, no, um, there was no hard evidence as far as neuroimaging, which, which was only the CAT scan, which wouldn't show anything anyways, no. um, then there wasn't a problem. And so then the patient is then put into a situation where it's them against <clears throat> the insurance company to cover the problem. And then the patient has to prove that they had a head injury, even though they were in an accident. And the only way that proof comes is with a positive MRI or a positive EEG. Those are usually the two ways that you can get um, uh, help. And even if you have a car accident, which is more dramatic than something falling on your head, this may happen. And so then you're struggling to get someone to recognize, wait a minute, I'm there's, you know, I'm sleeping all the time. I have massive headaches. I, I can't think. I can't remember. Uh, Rochelle, were you living up here in the Nevada County? Yes, I was. So, um, Cindy, is that a problem to be in a, a remote location like here? Uh, would Rochelle have stood a better chance if she were in San Francisco? <clears throat> I'm not sure. Yeah. I, so I, tell, I, us, 
tell us why that is. Because this is one of the, to me, the key ingredient in talking right. about TBI is just the simple inability for most physicians to understand what happened or even know what referral to make. Exactly. And so whether you're in the city or whether you're here in Nevada County, um, this could happen. And having come from Southern California and having seen many, many people who didn't come to me until years after their accident or come into a traumatic brain injury clinic until years after, where some doctor at some point made the recognition that there was a traumatic brain injury. So it usually has to come from a medical doctor. You have to garner the support of a doctor who knows the animal. So <clears throat> a physiatrist is a doctor of physical medicine and rehabilitation. That might be the point person. Once in a while, the, a, a lot of times what happens is you'll get a neuro, neurology consult, but they won't necessarily recommend any rehabilitation mm -hmm. after that. They'll just ask you to, to go home and um, uh, you know, six months later the brain swelling will go down and then hopefully you'll be better. Right. And in fact, you know, in my experience, neurologists are one of the principal barriers as a group to, to you know, getting the proper treatment. I mean, they have all kinds of diagnosis. Well, we're going to get back to Rochelle's case in a little bit, but now I would like to see, there's two other uh, uh, short uh, videos you want to see where those uh, two very different kinds of accidents took place. So if you roll the next B-roll, I would appreciate it. the dreams that you have for your kid? Will he get married? Will he have kids? You know, they've all changed. I was bowling and Josh came out of the bar about 9.30 that night and, you know, was talking to me. He was obviously drunk. And she said, you're not driving, are you? And I said, my, my car's not even here. And she's like, oh, okay. About an hour later, when I got done bowling, I went in to see if he'd come home with me, and they were gone. He knew he was going to live after like three weeks. They did the brain first, and um, he lived through that. They did the heart. He lived through that. And, and then it was just a waiting game, a, a daily battle of, you know, trying to keep him alive. No, I, I woke up from a coma, and I don't remember really much of the first year when I came home from the hospital. You know, my mom and dad had to rearrange their family room and have a hospital bed put in, in the family room. And, you know, I couldn't do anything on my own. I was totally out of it and in my own little world and incoherent of really anything that was going on around me. Okay, that's good. All of Josh's problems are from his brain injury. His bones healed, his heart healed, everything that, every problem that Josh has is because of his brain being injured. I've been fighting for, you know, eight years just to get my act together and, you know, and I know that I have very much so surpassed any of the odds and probabilities that I was given for the first year after I got hurt. But as a result of my injury, though, I just can't get my left arm and leg to work the way I want it to. And it's frustrating, frustrating, frustrating! football games. I do concessions for the football games and, and you see a kid, you know, get hurt and they go back in and play and I'm like, nobody takes it seriously. They just, they, they don't think about what, what's happening to the brain. I never wore, you know, a helmet when I was riding a bike or skateboarding, you know, and, and I can tell you why. You know why? Because this was never going to happen to me. I see kids with little kids without helmets on and I, and I think, parents, what are you doing? You know, meet my son Josh. You know, that's what I want to say to him. 
when my mom and I are in speaking of the driver's ed classes in high schools about drinking and driving, you know, I can see the, the punk kids that are sitting there just like I would have been 15 years ago, thinking, you know, man, screw you, it ain't gonna happen to me, it'll never happen to me. It just, it changed, it changed our whole routine then, and from then on, my son Jake was, um, looking at colleges and he changed his whole life plan. Um, my son Doug, I think to this day he's still angry. Josh's sister, she lost her mom. I mean, my, my life was taking care of Josh. You think you're going to make these decisions and, and, and they're only going to affect you and they don't. They affect everybody that you know. Before I got hurt, I, I could go anywhere and I had friends everywhere I went. You know, now I don't really have, you know, I, I you know, my, my best friend is my mom, you know, and she's stepped up to the plate at night, and she's been there every step of the way for me. You know, so I'm almost 30 years old, and my mother is my best friend. How cool is that, guys? <laughs> you know, it happened, and I got to deal with it, and I will be different forever. That's Mason and that's Wes. That's our son Mason. Who's that? Let's try one more time. Is that Mason? Who's Mason? That's Mason? Yeah. Who's that? That's Mr. Kelly. It's not Mr. Kelly. Let's try it one more time. What did you say? We're ready to go home. Not yet. Next Friday. Why can't we go home now? How oh, is that, Tiana? You want a little more? No. Really? Mm -hmm. You didn't eat very much. Sure. Let's see. Cigarettes? Yeah. Are they satisfying? What is it? Look, let me see. What is this? Queen cigarettes? 
Dairy Queen cigarettes. I don't think so, Fiona. Yeah, try it again. Let's try it again. What is it? Belsa. <gasps> Should that Belsa? Huh? That sounds Belsa. Belsa? Okay, but what is this? Those are uh, very uh, moving um, stories, and uh, we want to get back to Rochelle in, in, a, in a little bit. Uh, let's talk about what we saw. Um, in Josh's case, um, you could see that he was right on the edge um, of being frustrated and trying to come to grips with, you know, his uh, accident, um, you know, for some time afterward. We talked a little bit about how, in a sense, when you look at this, Joshua's story might be, um, some people might judge him that he himself did this to himself with a, you know, by driving uh, inebriated, and so you know, he deserved it or something you know, like that. Uh, in Tiana's case, it was a you know, completely different uh, circumstance. Is that typical of, uh, in, in your experience, Joshua's level of frustration? I think no matter how severe the head injury is, the level of frustration is extremely high. And um, in Josh's case, he was fortunate to be able to live at home with his parents and have that kind of rehabilitation. Many of the people with that severity of accident don't have a family, and so they end up in a convalescent hospital. Um, but even if you have someone who has what's called a mild traumatic brain injury, like most of the people in the support group that I run, every single one of them will express um, a lot of frustration and they tell me if I go to their house they can see the holes in the walls and the broken lamps and the family will also testify to their frustration. Right. Um, and so in, uh, in, in Tiana's case um, she was getting apparently uh, healing in, at, at some level. Mm -hmm. I mean carrying on her life Mm -hmm. uh, and you made the comment that if you were to take me to your support group, you, I wouldn't be able to tell at first glance who had had a uh, tra traumatic brain injury. Mm -hmm. and, and, and why is that? I mean, I mean, what's going on when it's apparently a person who has healed, and, but the, the aftermath is still with us? Well, I think when you say healed, we wonder what that means. Because right. you could see Tiana standing there, and she looked okay she but it said still healing now's when the healing really begins because you're starting to step out into the world see if you can get out of the house many people don't even come out of their house can't even go into the stimulation of the community until after a year or so and then they have to force themselves places like Kmart and the market those are out of the question because it's too overstimulating so um, when you see somebody at that point, it can take years and years and years and maybe even a lifetime to heal until there's um, some sort of uh, equilibrium that's, that's um, um, gained through a balance of accepting where the person is now, kind of leaving the old life behind mm -hmm. and, and moving on with a new perspective. Right. Now, Rochelle, you know, if I were to meet you in the supermarket and talk to you, I would say, you know, I would, I would not know that you had uh, any um, brain injury had sustained that. How, how, how healed are you in terms of cognitive skills? Well, I was able to get to be a certified um, neurofeedback therapist. Right. Are there any functions that. you can't do now that you could do before? Oh, certainly. Um, well, like what? My memory isn't nearly as good. I can't, 
like I know I can understand functions and processes, but I can't remember all the names that go with them sometimes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I lay back on that, that quote, um, don't, you don't have to remember anything you can look up. Mm -hmm. that's, I think that's Einstein that said that. So. Now, um, so, so emotionally, how has that affected you? Are you well, I've at peace with that fact that you know there's some parts of your life that are different now? Right. I went through a whole time where I was just wanting to be who I was before. It's like, can't I just go back and be that person I was before with all the function that I had and all the, the same way I felt? But after a while of struggling with that, I realized no one goes backwards. I mean, would you want to be the person you were two years ago? You don't want to be. Right. Because you're moving forward. Right. And so once I struggled through that and, and found that place and looked at it differently, it was just better. And now I can see the blessings that I've learned from my brain injury. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had learning disabilities, so I can understand those. Um, I've had speech problems, so I can understand those. I've had severe depression and severe anxiety. So I understand all those things, and the clients that I work with like that I really get it. Right. So. Can you talk uh, a little bit about your family situation? How did your family cope with this? It was a huge blow to the family. My husband could not work for two years because he had to take care of me, and it was full time. My daughter was, I think, 12. She had to learn how to cook a whole lot better than I had already taught her mm -hmm. because somebody had to make the food. Of course, the food bill went up because lots of frozen food happened at our house, and that never happened before. So, you know, and, and Mom couldn't remember stuff. And so you would, she would tell me something or my son would tell me something, and then a few minutes later I'd ask them right. the same question. Like, Mom, I already told you that. Right. <laughs> Well, tell me again. Maybe I'll remember this time. Um, and, and of course, I'm sure everybody in your family wanted you to get better. Yeah, they um, needed mom back. Yes. <laughs> and so we were talking about before that um, the aftermath and the effects of a TBI really extend far from just the person who's involved. Not that that's you know it's severe as it is, but. You know, asking a family, you know, look at the circumstances. I mean, they, they're not, uh, there's no affirmation in the community. The medical folks may or may not believe you or understand what's going on. Insurance benefits dry up because, you know, you're no longer broken. Um, and, and this family, um, without any uh, preparation, is expected to, uh, you know, adjust to a person who has mood swings and memory problems and, and those kinds of things. So you have a support group. Tell us about, is, is that what you do in your support group, try to deal with those issues? Uh, family members are always invited to the group, uh, and sometimes they come. Primarily the survivor is the one who comes. But although sometimes a survivor won't come and, and just the spouse will come. And uh, I would say a lot of what we do is we share experience. So the main thing I find that's difficult is this acceptance piece that Rochelle was talking about. So one part of that is to know that there are other people who have the same sort of difficulty because the person has been isolated for however time it took them to even get out of the house and they have never had any exposure to this before so they're the only ones in the world who are going through this. By coming to the support group they can meet a number of people who have memory problems, anxiety issues, visual changes, the same sorts of frustrations that they're experiencing. And then we can share how we've uh, navigated the um, rehabilitation maze, the medical maze, the social maze, what happens with friends, why are all my friends gone? Um, that's huge. Very difficult to keep friendships after this has happened. Right. So. It's to um, share resources in large part, in, including um, the, ourselves or themselves. They're sharing what's happened to in their life that can help another person who's going through the same sort of thing and let them know they're not alone. Right. Um, 
We have uh, a couple of minutes left, probably uh, about seven or eight minutes. Um, two questions. One is, how big a issue is traumatic brain injury, do you think? If, I mean, there's a lot of it goes undiagnosed, mm -hmm. given that. There's any studies that would indicate, you know, what percentage of uh, adult population in America has sustained a traumatic brain injury? Hmm. What percentage? I, I think we saw some statistic on the, the million per year, right. year or, or something like that. So I'm not sure what we're up to in population now. Um, but what, I've, what I would say is ask yourself the question, do, any of these, do I know anybody with these sorts of symptoms? Or do I have any family members who um, have had these sorts of problems? And you probably will find either within your um, family or extended family or within uh, different groups you belong to, like churches or so on, that there are people who may have had this based on the symptoms that we've described today and have a head injury but don't talk about it. But if you were to talk to them, they would probably reveal to you, or if you have a family member, say, for example, a brother who's run his motorcycle into a tree a few times and has never been the same since and is now holed up in his house, not coming out much, then you say, oh, he probably had a few traumatic brain injuries, but nobody ever recognized it as such. We just fixed the broken arm. So uh, let's go down to sort of the lowest level of, you know, um, less severe brain injury. Mm -hmm. Does any, does everyone who has had a concussion, do you think, sustain the TBI? Well, I guess that's up for grabs because what is a concussion? What is the definition of concussion? I was just reading an article on that that um, talks about loss of consciousness, but then they said, no, you don't have to have loss of consciousness in order to have a, um, a concussion. And a concussion is sort of one of those clean terms that we use because basically a concussion is going to be okay after 24 hours and then you can go back to doing what you did before. So it really has to do with definition and well, I guess that could be answered post-mortem if you take a look at the brain, if you're able to take a look at the brain afterwards, and for sure I bet you would find um, neuronal, axonal um, changes as a result of that, the healing process, all of that um, in place. So what we look at is function. Right. And I had a doctor today say, well, you can't tell if there was a traumatic brain injury until time goes by and then you see what happens. And there's, there's a lot of truth to that because after a week or two or you're getting worse and worse and worse, you're not getting better. So that's when you start to get some recognition. If you have someone who recognizes that and says, wow, you know, Jane isn't the same as she was before this happened. Maybe we should take her back to the doctor and talk to him or her about that. So if this issue is so large, it appears to be ubiquitous, almost everyone, as you point out, might have somebody who you might, you know, uh, logically think have sustained a TBI. Why isn't this, why isn't there better treatment? Why isn't there better training and recognition on part of physicians? Why do insurance companies continue to get away with not having any benefits? How come? Yeah, it's, it's a little bit of a mystery to me, Paul. But I guess it has to do with money mm -hmm. and the extent to which um, uh, rehabilitation is required to gain some sort of function again. And that's frustrating here in Nevada County because whereas if I was in Southern California or in San Francisco, you would have rehab teams, traumatic brain injury teams that would work together. Here we're a little bit splintered. Now Rochelle had a, a team come to her house and work with her. So there, there is um, a resource called Community Without uh, Walls. Rehab Without Walls. Re rehab Without Walls. So there are, and we have uh, a, a couple of physiatrists in town, Dr. Jensen and Dr. Ridgenack, mm -hmm. who um, I would highly recommend if somebody had a traumatic brain injury or sensed that, and um, you could take your loved one to those particular doctors who would recognize it. But um, again, because it's not a broken bone, 
it's uh, not something that's seen, and we don't have the tools to measure it. We think we're really advanced with our neuroimaging, but a lot of times, even with an MRI, mm -hmm. nothing may show up. Mm -hmm. And then you're out of luck with the insurance companies right. because they, they no, will not yeah, cover no the injury. objective evidence, as it were. Exactly. So we have about a minute, a little more than a minute left. Rochelle, what? What message would you like to give people at home about, about this? What's the single thing you'd like them to understand about your experience? Wow. Well, when you're talking to somebody with a brain injury, you don't say, but you look nice, you look great. Mm. That, that's really annoying. Um, the other thing that I really took away from this was if this had happened to me when I was in high school or college, I would not have been able to finish. And so the first thing that comes to mind is don't let your kids play football. Mm -hmm. yeah, why put <laughs> your entire future at risk? It's crazy for a game. For, for a game. <laughs> um, so uh, one thing, uh, Cindy, I, we should say for our, our audience out there that this is going to be, we're going to have another three parts mm -hmm. at least, maybe four parts. Mm -hmm. And we are going to delve into some of these issues about uh, sports and sports injuries and, and how that happens and uh, some other ideas about, you know, what are the gaps in, you know, medical understanding and uh, insurance knowledge and everything. I want to thank you for coming on, thank Cindy you, and Rochelle. Thank you so much. Um, so as I said, we will be airing, uh, in addition to our shows, some other shows that have been taped about traumatic brain injury that uh, took place in Sacramento. So um, we're going to be carrying this forward for the next couple of months. But that's about all we have time for today. So uh, this is Paul Minacucci signing off saying uh, thank you very much for watching. I uh, hope you will look forward to seeing more about TBI. Good night. <laughs>